strange objects. According to the standard theories, the comets were formed about the same time as the planets, which if you're an evolutionist or you're an evolutionary cosmologist, would put the formation of the comets at about four and a half billion years ago. But comets, as you know, have a tail, and here's a picture of hale Bop, have a tail because as they get near the sun, they warm up and they start to lose material into space, which is then illuminated by the sun, which gives you the tail, which is very spectacular. So the average life of a comet is only several thousand years, depending how often it comes past the sun. Something like Halley's Comet comes every 80 or so years, but after a while, it's going to actually all boil away and have nothing left. So the average life of a long period comet, not the short period comets, there's, a, there's another family of comets called the short period comets that go around very quickly in a couple of years, rather than long period comets which go around maybe tens of hundred, uh, to 100 years. The average life is only going to be about 1,000 years. So you need to have a source of these comets if they were actually formed billions of years ago and are still being used up. Otherwise you run out very quickly. And so the astronomers have got around the problem. Well, an astronomer by the name of Oort got around the problem by saying, well, actually, we, he suggested the Oort cloud as a source of the long period comets. So what is the Oort cloud? Well, Mr. Oort made his suggestion back in 1950. You have a diagram of what he th thinks the Oort cloud looks like. So you have the planets in the middle here. And uh, Pluto is out here. And out to about one light year, you have what's called the Oort cloud. It's basically a cloud of comet-sized objects in a spherical shell around the sun. And every now and then, a passing star just perturbs the gravitational field slightly, and one of these comets drops in towards the sun. So they can come from any direction, which is what long-period comets do. Long-period comets are interesting because they can come actually from out uh, 90 degrees perpendicular to the Earth, or they can come in the same plane as planets. So they can come from any, any direction, which means you need... Uh, if you are, if you are a, a long, if you have a four, four billion year old solar system, you need a constant source of these comets because they only last for a few thousand years maximum. So, Mr. Jan Oort, who's a Dutchman, I believe, suggested this Oort cloud in the 1950s, and uh, he suggested this cloud, but it's never actually been observed. It's a very interesting phenomenon, and some astronomers have made a comment in, in the scientific literature that here we have an object that's never been observed, or a phenomenon that's never been observed, which is cited in the literature over and over again to explain the, the origin of comets. So is that scientific? Well, not very. So, but to get around the problem of where the comets come from, we have to have this cloud out there. It's a reasonable assumption, but it's only an assumption. And uh, you might recently have heard of some objects which they think came from the Oort cloud. There's one called um, Sedna which people think might be an Oort cloud object. Unfortunately, it's rather large, and it's actually too close. It's actually only about, uh, it's only just uh, maybe twice the distance of Pluto from the Sun, so it's not far enough out to be one of the Oort cloud comets. It's actually too big. It's several hundred kilometres across. It's almost planet size, so it's very unlikely to actually be an Oort cloud object. So the only piece of, the best piece of evidence they've got is this, this object, which is not really you know, the right size, it's not really in the right place. So we have, a, we have a problem if you have an old solar system, where do all the comets come from? And the, the, uh, the alternative uh, hypothesis is, well, actually, the comets aren't that old, so therefore there's still plenty of them left to go around at the sun and give us these interesting astronomical displays. Another problem for the old, um, the old cosmos argument, or the old uh, Earth argument, is the faint sun paradox. Now, if the sun is a main sequence star, which most people accept that it is, don't have much problem with that, a main sequence star has a lifetime, on conventional terms, of 10 billion years. This is the astronomical uh, accepted theory. So the, the sun is going to last for about another 5 billion years, so don't worry too much. <clears throat> so it's about 4.5 to 5 billion years old, if the evolutionary story is correct which means about half the hydrogen in the sun has now been used up and has been converted into helium, which gives us the energy, which keeps us warm, gives us light, and brings life on the Earth. Without that, we'd, have, we'd be nowhere. So about half the hydrogen is used up. And as the hydrogen is used up, it actually gets hotter rather than colder, surprisingly enough. There's no problem there. Uh, it's basically because of the, of the physics of the sun. Don't ask me to go into it. I'm a biologist, but that's, that, that's the accepted theory. Nobody questions that. But that means that... If the sun has evolved and is now, it was now nearly 40% brighter than it would have been four and a half billion years ago, which means basically 40% hotter. 
Now, we think we've got a problem with global warming now. That's nothing. 40% increase in brightness. I mean, we'd be fried. But if the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, the Earth would have been a block of ice, more than a block of ice. It would have been freezing cold. Uh, there would be no possibility of life, the kind of life we have on Earth now. So the geologists come up with various scenarios, say, well, we had lots of greenhouse gases, keep the Earth warm. Um, well, some of them have said, well, we did have kind of a snowball Earth kind of situation. But these are kind of ad hoc uh, justifications to try and explain how life could possibly evolve while the Earth was a block of ice because the sun was a good deal colder than it, w than it is now. And to get around the problem, you actually have to have the atmosphere evolving at the same rate the sun is evolving and life is evolving, so it all fits together. Which, if you ask me, is quite a big ask. An awful lot of coincidence has to take place for that to, do, to occur. Whereas if the sun is actually only 6,000 years old, the problem disappears. So the faint sun paradox is a big issue for evolutionists. And they haven't really got a convincing argument to, to explain how life could have evolved when the sun was an awful lot cooler than it, would have, than it is now. So enough of astronomy. Let's do a bit of chemistry. <clears throat> Two bits of evidence which suggest that the Earth is actually a lot younger than we're told. One coming from salt in the oceans and the other from helium in the atmosphere. Right, the salt in the oceans comes mainly from rivers. Rivers will wash over the rocks, the soil, and salt that's it present in the, in the rocks, in the soil, is dissolved in the, in the river and taken out to sea, and it gradually accumulates. So there's a rate of input of salt into the seas, which can be measured. And the rate of input is actually worldwide 450 million tonnes of sodium, in terms of sodium, per year. Salt is sodium chloride. So that's easy to measure, and that's, there's nobody contests the numbers here, actually. The rate of loss is about uh, 120 million tonnes per year, most of the loss being that, that basically as the sea washes up on the shore, you get spray, and the salt is deposited on your car and makes it rust. Uh, that's why your cars rust when, they, when, you, when you live in Edinburgh. So the rate of loss is actually easy to, fairly easy to measure. It's about 120 uh, million tonnes per year. So you can actually work out, from the, knowing the rates of input and the rates of output, as, as to how long it would take for the sea to be at its present salinity starting from zero, which is your, your most favourable assumption for the evolutionist. So if we make the assumption that to start off with all the sea was fresh water, it would actually only take 40 to 60 million years for the present concentration to be reached. And this is a maximum figure. Okay? This is the maximum age of the sea based on the amount of salt that there is in it, on all, uh, taking into account all the figures that we know. So where's your billions of years? So somehow you've got to explain away the fact that the sea is not an awful lot saltier, saltier than it is. So again, suggesting that the sea might possibly be a good deal younger than three billion years. Helium in the atmosphere is another piece of evidence which suggests, again, that the Earth is a lot younger, or the Earth's atmosphere, and therefore the Earth, is a lot younger than we're led to believe sometimes. Most of the helium in the Earth's atmosphere comes from radioactive decay. Helium is a small molecule, two protons, two neutrons, and a couple of electrons, variable, doesn't have to have electrons, but helium is quite a small molecule. But it, the main source, as far as we can tell, is from radioactive decay. And we're going to come back to helium and radio, radioactive decay towards the end of this talk. And helium, of course, being a light molecule, is constantly lost from the Earth's atmosphere into space. It's not very difficult for it to leave. So people have looked at the helium balance in the atmosphere, and they've discovered that the rate at which helium enters the atmosphere vastly outweighs the rate that it's lost into space. So an awful lot more helium is going into the atmosphere than is currently being lost. Right, so it's, there's a big imbalance. It's huge. And what it basically means is that the current quantity of helium would accumulate in no more than 2 million years. Again, the maximum age of the atmosphere based on the helium balance, the inputs and outputs, is 2 million years. That's all you've got. So you need to explain why the atmosphere appears to be so young if you're an evolutionist and you believe the Earth is actually uh, four and a half billion years old and the atmosphere would be, what, uh, three, three billion years at least. So another problem for the old Earth scenario where helium, the helium balance suggests that the Earth is an awful lot younger than we're told. And again, these are maximum ages. There's the upper limits. You can't go beyond the limit. You can be a lot less. So it's consistent with a young Earth of only thousands of years old. <coughs> 